Section 4 of The Black Cat, Volume 2, Number 7, April 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Cat, Volume 2, Number 7, April 1897. Section 4 McGulligan by Francis Lynde. These things came to pass in the year when Jasper came to its own again, and the county offices of Benton were removed from Orville to their former quarters in the older town. That was in the reign of Bart Duger, sheriff, and George Lawton, his deputy. Jasper had been first a cow town, afterward a railway supply station for Orville, and, later still, when the mining camp sickened and died of inanition, and the network of the English syndicate's irrigation canals cobwebbed the valley, the market town of a not overpopulous but growing ranch district. Duger, the sheriff, was a weather-worn relic of the cattle era, sparing of speech to the verge of sullenness, and with a record for violence not overborne by that of any man on the St. Vrain, he was, none the less, a good officer, harsh in discipline, but instant in action, and fighting as cheerfully on the side of law and order as in the past he had now and again fought otherwise. Lawton, the deputy, was a fresher importation, dating back only to the rush following the discovery of mineral in Kinchito Canyon. He was a young man, hailing from one of the smaller cities of the Middle West, and had come to Colorado to make haste to be rich. Failing in this, like some other thousands of his fellow migrants, he would fain to do what he could, and when the Kinchito petered out and Duger offered him the deputyship, he accepted the offer not ungratefully. I'm not the man you want, he had said to Duger's overture, but I'll take it and hold it down as long as I can. When I make the break, I'm sure too, sooner or later, you can let me out. It's my play, said Duger laconically. I know, and you usually play to win, but I'm afraid you won't this time. Lawton's protest was based upon an impartial estimate of his own character. Nature had cast him for a man of peace, and had spoiled the design by spilling rather more than one man's proportion of self-consciousness into the mold. The result was as if the soul of a soldier had somehow got entangled in the body of a swineherd, to use Lawton's own metaphor. Curious things came of the entanglement, and oftenest this, that he was not infrequently pushed headlong into doing a rash thing from sheer fear that he should otherwise fail to be reasonably courageous. That was the case in the capture of McGulligan, over which Jasper waxed eloquent. On the night of April 19, the Kinchito Bank was burglarized, and the burglar, there was but one, was discovered in the act by the night watchman. Thereupon the man dropped his booty, exchanged complimentary shots with the watchman, and made a successful dash for liberty. The following day, word was brought to Sheriff Duger that the robber was entrenched in an abandoned mine in the canyon. Duger was for organizing a posse forthwith and went out to do it, but Lawton lagged behind to question the informer. The abandoned mine chanced to be one in which the deputy had worked, and he was suddenly confronted with a hazard which a brave man might have creditably refused, but which a conscientious coward was bound to accept. Therefore, Lawton accepted it, hiring a saddle horse at Allen's stables and riding away toward the foothills an hour in advance of the posse. Halfway to the canyon, Duger and his company, riding hard, met the deputy coming in with his prisoner. Questioned on the spot by five men in a breath, Lawton was modestly reticent, but later, in the privacy of the sheriff's office, he expanded. He was in the old Alamo tunnel, with the entrance barricaded. What for? The Lord only knows. If he'd gone in and left things as he found them, nobody would ever have thought of looking there for him. As you may remember, there is an air shaft in the Alamo, three hundred feet or such a matter up the hill. I slid down that 
and stalked him from behind. That's all. Fight, said the sheriff, relighting his cigar. Lawton shook his head. Another man might have given him a show, but I couldn't afford to. I called him down with a gun. The sheriff's impassive face lightened, and he laughed under his drooping mustache. You're a hell of a coward, he said, and then he broke his taciturn habit and went out to tell the town what it was waiting to learn. It was a bi-weekly scrub day in the Benton County Jail when the armored door opened to admit McGulligan. Two of the prisoners, barefooted and with their trousers rolled knee-high, were swabbing the stone floor, and the others, a score or more, were perched in the windows on the pyramid of stools piled against the wall and elsewhere out of the swabber's way. Three steps led down from the iron-clad door to the floor of the corridor, and on the lowest of these McGulligan paused to look about him. There was scant welcome in the eyes that met his scowling stare for cause. McGulligan was not prepossessing, and even the inmates of a jail may have their ideas of social distinctions. Wherefore, the score or more scowled in return, and omitted to demand the customary entrance fee of tobacco, usually exacted of newcomers. McGulligan noted the omission, and emphasized its contempt by ostentatiously taking a chew from an unbitten plug, after which he turned his attention to the swabbers. Say, time you fellas been over the road once or twice, you shall know more about swabbing down than you do now, he remarked, kicking the nearest bucket to the end of the corridor. Slide your machinery out of the way till I can get across to me boudoir. That was the beginning of a jail tyranny, and the bare-legged ones knew it and were minded to rebel. But a second glance at McGulligan's brutal face with its projecting under jaw and ferret-like eyes quelled the insurrectionary prompting once for all, and McGulligan's despotic reign began from that moment. It was an ill wind which had blown the housebreaker to Colorado, it was in no sense a migration in intention. It was merely a flying trip, taken to give certain roiled waters in his eastern haunts time to settle, and, that his hand might not lose its cunning meantime, he had come to Jasper and sought a little diversion at the expense of the stockholders of the Conchito Bank. He was, therefore, not of the West, its time, place, or people. On the contrary, he was distinctly urban and metropolitan in his tastes and habits, and it irked him to be jailed in a crude western town where prison usages were primitive and the discipline unenlightened. For this cause he became first assistant corporal on the inside, as Shorty Riley phrased it, from the day of his introduction, bullying the others by word of mouth chiefly, but threatening eviler things to follow the first complaint to Lawton. Gradually, and by sheer force of abuse, he made good his claim to leadership, and when the time was fully ripe, he proposed a wholesale jail delivery by way of breaking the monotony. The scheme met with opposition at first, principally from those who were serving short sentences, but McGulligan finally overruled this, and when he was sure of support, he drilled and organized his recruits, fitting each man to his place in a clockwork-like system which was a masterpiece in its way. For a time all went well. The turnkey was an unobservant man, and McGulligan's system easily befooled him. The great door in the corridor was reinforced by an iron grating on the outside, a blacksmith's contrivance with an old-fashioned lock which gave timely and plenteous warning of the jailer's approach. So Prescott, the turnkey, came and went and saw nothing amiss, and even Lawton, who made a daily inspection, was slow to yield to a growing sense of impending trouble. When he did yield, the premonition took shape, and the daily inspection became a painstaking search for a clue to McGulligan's mystery. But for all the deputy's vigilance, the clue was not immediately forthcoming. Time and again he made quick sallies at odd hours into the inner corridor, hoping to surprise whatever undertaking was afoot, but always without success. There was never anything amiss. However cautiously he made his approach, he always found the prisoners scattered about the corridor, playing cards, whittling, dozing on the cots, each apparently fighting the daily battle with prison inway in the most ordinary manner. 
It was only by chance that he finally remarked one suspicious circumstance. It was that the card players were invariably beginning a game when he entered. It was but a straw, but it pointed suspicion, and he racked his brain to devise some means of spying upon the corridor from without. That, too, proved impossible. The jail had been built in primitive days by stonemasons who were not prison architects and for security rather than espionage. More than once he was tempted to take counsel of the sheriff, but humanity restrained him. He knew Duger's temper, and that a word from him would send the men into solitary confinement. In the end, Lawton decided upon a master stroke. Taking Prescott into his confidence, he set a trap for McGulligan in this wise. One morning, during inspection, he ordered Prescott to the other end of the town to make an appointment for him with a certain mythical personage, name not given. Tell him I'll be there in fifteen minutes, and then wait till I come. I may want you, he added in a low tone for McGulligan's benefit. The ruse was successful. When the outer grating clanged behind Lawton, McGulligan climbed to a window commanding a view of the street waited until he saw the deputy on his way downtown, and then gave the signal. Fall in, fellies. It's de clear track. We've got till one or de two comes back, he said. At the word, the everyday aspect of the place vanished. One man took his place on the steps with his ear against the ironclad door. Two more posted themselves each at a window, and the others formed a line from the stove to an unused cell with four men on their knees with their fingers under the zinc and the others supporting the pipe with a wire. McGulligan nodded, and the heavy stove slid aside, revealing a circle on the floor with a finger hole in the center. The housebreaker lifted the trap and dropped quickly into the excavation beneath it. Gimme de tools. There's daylight. The interruption was the unheralded opening of the armored door. It was flung back so suddenly that the sentinel went down on the flagging with a yell of pain and dismay, and Lawton and the turnkey, stocking-footed, sprang into the corridor and locked the door behind them. McGulligan climbed out of the tunnel with the air of one who knows when he is fairly worsted. "'Got me down, Captain, didn't ye?' he said, grinning. "'But I'm telling you there wasn't no time to burn.' Then, to his fellow bondman, with a foreknowledge born of penitential experience, Jigs up, Cullies. Get in your cells. That's the next thing to do. It was not only the next, but it would have been the last as regards corridor liberty for that lot of prisoners, had not Lawton labored manfully with Duger. The sheriff would have decreed solitary confinement and bread and water, but the deputy prevailed, and when the repairs were completed, the cells were once more thrown open. It was Lawton himself who unlocked McGulligan's door and gave him the freedom of the corridor. The housebreaker's experience in similar affairs had not been of the sort to soften him, but he was evidently moved. "'Say, Captain, what you givin' us?' he demanded, when Lawton told him to get out and stretch his legs. "'What you had before you made your break,' said Lawton. "'The hell you say. I ain't on to no such thing as that. You bet I ain't givin' no parole.' said McGulligan. Lawton took that as a mere declaration of rights and passed it over in silence. But afterward, a curious glimmering of friendship came and went between the hardened sinner and his captor. It was a friendship quite undefinable in stated terms, commonplace or otherwise. But it existed, nevertheless, and Lawton knew it and wondered what buried grain of gold he had chanced to upturn in the heart of a man whose blood was of Ishmael and whose hand was against every man's. He spoke of it one evening when he was out driving with Kate Warburton, behind the judge's span of meddlesome thoroughbreds. They had been as far as the mouth of the canyon, and the sight of the abandoned Alamo had suggested McGulligan. "'It's odd, and I shouldn't encourage it if I were you,' said Kate, with the privileged frankness of a fiancé. "'Perhaps he's only biding his time to do you up.' The judge's daughter was western-born, and the slang borrowed dignity from the fact. "'I might suspect that if he wasn't always taking pains to keep me from finding out,' rejoined Lawton. "'Then how do you know?' "'In many ways. For instance, he has been the jail bully ever since the first day of his confinement. 
but whereas he used to stir up trouble for Prescott and the rest of us, he now tyrannizes on the side of discipline. Moreover, latterly, he has been letting me get glimpses of things that you wouldn't expect to find in a man of his breed. Like what? Kate asked. Lawton pitched upon the best-remembered incident. One morning, when I was making my round, he was standing at a window staring up at the sky with a look in his eyes that I'd never seen in them before. As a matter of fact, his eyes are his worst feature. You would as soon look for purely human longings in those of a wolf. I was passing him with a nod when he said, Say, Cap'n, don't it never rain in this bloomin' country? I told him it did, on occasion, and he broke out with an oath. Say, I'd be givin' one of me front teeth to see the green grass growin' and the trees and all that again, I would by cripes, Cap'n. And then he went on to ask what kind of place Canyon City is, and if there were more trees and grass and fewer mountains. Kate's sympathies were aroused, and she wanted to hear more. It's hard to particularize, said Lawton. It's only a word here and there, or a look, and most of the time he is still the hardened outlaw that he has to be. He doesn't say much, and when he does talk, it is usually about his trial and how much time he is likely to get. How much will he get? I don't know. The full limit, I suppose. He has served two terms in eastern prisons, and that will go against him. Now, Kate Warburton was one of those who have drunk at the Fountain of Mercy, and from that evening McGulligan had an intercessor that he little dreamed of. Being her father's housekeeper, Kate had the judge at a disadvantage, and, watching her chances, introduced the thin edge of the wedge of leniency so deftly that the shrewd old lawyer never suspected her design. Afterward, she drove the wedge with gentle tappings, and a week before the trial gave way to a natural desire to see the man whom she was trying to befriend. Accordingly, the following morning, the judge's thoroughbreds paused before the jail, and Lawton, who was on duty in the office, hastened out bareheaded. "'What is it?' he asked, reading a purpose in Kate's eyes. "'Not the sight of you,' she said heartily, laughing in his face. "'I came to see Mr. McGulligan.' "'You can't,' said Lawton. "'He's not receiving. Besides, you haven't brought any cut flowers.' "'Nonsense. I don't want to meet him.' Be still, will you?" This to the off-thoroughbred, who was trying to dance a quick step on the edge of the curbstone. But I want to see him, just the same. Can't you arrange it? Lawton glanced up at the barred window of the jail, and turned with his foot on the hub. Wait a minute, so that he won't catch on. Then look at the third window in the lower tier. Kate nodded, and toyed with the whip to kill time. The off-thoroughbred heard the swish of the lash, and rose on its hind legs, in indignant protest. Lawton was at his bit in a twinkling, and when peace was restored he went back to the wheel with a warning on his tongue. You take too many chances driving these bays, he said. It's no woman's outfit, and they'll smash you up some day. Kate's lip curled in pardonable scorn. Then she laughed. I haven't been driving broncos ever since I can remember to be afraid of a Kentuckian, or two of them, she said. I never had a runaway in my life. Then her gaze wandered to the third window in the lower tier, and she saw McGulligan. For the moment, sympathy went adrift, and she shuddered. Mercy, she said, under her breath, what a face. It's bad, bad. I think you must be mistaken, George. In McGulligan? I think not. You must remember that I haven't claimed much for him, not more than a color or two of gold in a pan full of very common clay. I know but his face doesn't show even that. Do be careful, George. I'm sure he is only biding his time. For what? He is well looked after. Yes, now. But you will have to take him to Canyon City, won't you, after the trial? I suppose so. That will be his last chance, and he looks terrible enough to do anything. Don't let your sympathy make you careless. Lawton smiled rather grimly. Carelessness, where my own personal safety is concerned, is not one of my failings. What would you have me do? Oh, I don't know. But if I were a man and had it to do, I should never lose sight of him for a moment. And if he tried to do anything, I'd shoot him in cold blood, I suppose, said Lawton, with mock ferocity. 
Then he laughed and sent her away with an added word of caution about the horses. But later, when he was once more smoking his cigar in the office, her words bore fruit. What if, after all, the housebreaker were only paving the way for a last desperate dash for liberty? He must know well enough that he would be sent to the penitentiary, and that the deputy would be on his guard on the journey. The other prisoners could tell him that. What more natural, therefore, than that he should seek to lull suspicion beforehand by such small means as he could command? In considering it, Lawton fell once more under the spell of his weakness. He lacked a brave man's magnanimity, and, knowing it, took counsel of that prudence which is the twin sister of ruthless suspicion. When it should come to making the journey with McGulligan, he would take no chances, and the convict himself should be made to understand. At his trial, McGulligan pleaded guilty, and otherwise demeaned himself as a man who had made up his mind beforehand to give the prosecution as little trouble as might be. His attitude nullified in part, as it was bound to be by his crime-branded face, had its effect on the jury, and there was the merest suggestion of a recommendation to judicial clemency in the foreman's announcement of the verdict. The seed of suggestion fell in fertile soil, prepared for it aforetime by the judge's daughter, and the burglar got seven years instead of ten. He was not sentenced in court. It was Lawton who told him on the eve of the journey to Canyon City. "'It's light, as you know, Mac,' said the deputy. "'You shot at the watchman, and that wasn't taken into account.' McGulligan nodded. "'I ain't kicking,' he said briefly. "'You've no reason to kick. Judge Warburton did the best he could for you.' The burglar nodded again. "'De judge, he was square. I ain't saying a word, am I? But it was de young lady what give him de tip, see?' "'What young lady?' demanded the deputy. McGulligan grinned knowingly. "'Why, the judge's daughter. I seen her when she come up here driving dem bays, and I says to myself, says I, "'Cully, that's your mascot.' Then I see her in the court, and she says, says she, "'There's a poor felly what's down on his luck, and I just give the governor a tip,' and she done it. Lawton had suspected as much all along, but he was not best pleased that McGulligan should have been shrewd enough to guess at the truth. So he said, The less said about that young lady, the better, Mac. Now go and wash up, and we'll take a ride on the cars. McGulligan started for his cell, and then came back shuffling his feet with his head hanging. Say, Cap'n, there's another thing. Nobody else ain't never gone to get no show to tell her, cause you's gone and called to turn but I'd spout one of me front teeth to have her know some day. See? Know what? said Lawton. Know that I was on, that I went to hell thinking about what she'd done. See? I'll tell her, said Lawton, as the easiest way to bury the matter, and McGulligan went to prepare for the journey. In the outer corridor, Lawton gave the convict his final instructions. The motive behind the words was a curious commingling of the better and worse sides of the deputy's character. "'I'm going to parole you, Mac,' he said curtly. "'At least so far as the irons are concerned. You'll walk to the depot two steps ahead of me, and I'm going to take it for granted you won't make a break. But you must walk straight and keep your hands in your pockets. If you try to run for it, you'll get a bullet in the back. Do you understand?' I'm on, said McGulligan, quietly. But say, Cap'n, you might send the kid. There ain't no funny business left in me. They left the jail as Lawton had prefigured, the convict ahead, with his eyes on the sidewalk and his hands in his coat pockets, the deputy two paces to the rear, keeping step with McGulligan, watchful, alert, suspicious of everything, and of nothing so much as his own late analysis of McGulligan's character. Three squares down the main street they went, their feet beating even time upon the planking, the prisoner with his head down, and Lawton with his eyes that saw only the man in front. At the third corner he gave the sharp order, left wheel, and they turned into the avenue leading to the railway station. Halfway to the first cross street, Lawton became dimly conscious of an approaching commotion, shouts, the purr of spurring wheels, the thunder of galloping horses in the roadway half-conscious only, for his soul was in his eyes, and his eyes were fixed upon the slouching figure of McGulligan. 
At the critical moment, when the din rushed down upon them, the deputy's resolution to let nothing divert him wavered for a single instant, and he looked aside and saw that which sent the blood from his heart to brain and back again, until he was sick with horror. The commotion was a runaway. The snorting horses were Judge Warburton's thoroughbreds, with the reins whipping the dust at their heels, and in the reeling buggy Kate sat, clinging to the boughs of the canopy top, very rigid and silent, but with the fear of death marring the winsome beauty of her face. All this Lawton saw as one sees things by the dazzling flare of a camera flashlight. His first impulse was to forget everything but the danger which menaced the woman he loved. But he was recalled sharply to a sense of his sworn duty when McGulligan sprang out into the roadway and made as if he would cross before the flying team, and so lose himself in the ruck of pursuers on the opposite sidewalk. Lawton was a good shot, and he drew his revolver quickly, meaning to stop the convict first and one of the horses afterward. He aimed at the man as he was darting under the heads of the horses, and the report rang sharp above the pounding of hooves and the shouts of the pursuers. Up to the instant when his finger pressed the trigger, Lawton's nerve had not failed him, but when he would have fired again at one of the horses, a great doubt seized him, and he flung the weapon away with an oath and dashed after the runaway which presently came to a stand, with the near horse wallowing in the dust. Kate was out of the buggy when he ran up, and pointed with shaking finger to the struggling horse. McGulligan, the convict, he's under the horse, she gasped, fighting back the creeping horror that threatened to choke her. You killed him while he was trying to save my life, and I, it was I who, oh, God forgive me, I'm no better than his murderer. Lawton's eyes followed the girl's trembling finger. There, half under the withers of a floundering horse, lay McGulligan, his hands still clenching the reins at the bit and the death rigor deepening the lines in his rugged face. Stabbed with a quick piercing remorse, Lawton leaped to the aid of the dying man. Yet even in the pangs of a wound for which already he knew there was no healing, he gave to the shaken woman who knelt by his side a word of comfort. Don't blame yourself. I should have done it if you hadn't warned me. Then the bitterness of it stabbed him again, and he added, It's a coward's prerogative to shoot first and think afterward. There were willing hands to assist the deputy in lifting McGulligan from the pavement, but the man died before they could carry him to the curb. It was Lawton who saw the end coming and told them to put him down, and the judge's daughter knelt beside him and wiped the sweat from his forehead. He opened his eyes at that and recognized her. Tell the captain... I ain't kicking, he gasped. I broke the parole, and he had to do it. See? And whatsoever answered to the soul of McGulligan spent itself on the last word, and the convict was free. End of section four. Recording by Narrator J.